Tsar Nicholas II, sentimental, petulant, practices the divine right to rule at his palace outside St. Petersburg and frowns at a changing world. Minister of the Interior von Pleva, more vigorous by nature, organizes repression with system, if not subtlety. Both in Russia and beyond her frontiers, the question is no longer whether revolution, but how and led by whom. Majesty of the state has no business organizing workers to present economic demands to employers. There are plenty of revolutionists around to do that, God knows. The state's job is containment. We put out fires, we eliminate fire raisers. Jews, anarchists, revolutionists. Fortunately, the same size in a gun sight. 69 rioters killed, 143 wounded, over 200 arrests made, two dozen already hanged. It's all there in the file. We can win if we have the will, Majesty, but we must make them understand that we are serious, and if we are serious, we must be coherent, we must be ruthless, and above all, we must be intelligent. I ordered a grenadier regiment up from Orenburg to burn a few houses and restore order. I shot several crows this morning. <laughs> are they all my enemies? Potentially, as they are all your loyal and devoted friends and subjects. The people are merely the stakes, Your Majesty. And whom do we play for them? Well, they are all here. Socialist revolutionaries, liberals, anarchists, social democrats. Jew? Jew. Aren't there any Russians? One or two, Your Majesty. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look at them. Who are these? Social democrats. Dreamers, mostly. Marxists, they call themselves. Plukhanov. The leading figure. This one, Jew, yes. Martov, born uh, Sederbaum. And this? Ulyanov, agitator, 14 months in the Marinka, awaiting trial, sentenced to three years exile, 97. Minusinsk. The last known report has him in Munich, married to this one here. But maybe she'll give him some babies. Make him settle down in Germany. Ah. <laughs> of course, my political police abroad are monitoring their every movement. The landlady wanted to know if Dr. and Mrs. Richter were married. She wanted a marriage certificate. There's no problem. I showed her the ring. I didn't know you still had it. I thought it might be of use. Now you must have breakfast and then you must go to the printers. And you have to contact Zuzulich and Marto. Wrong again, friend. There will be no revolution in Russia based upon the peasant. Read some Marx, man. The peasant is a petty bourgeois reactionary element and arch proponent of progress, as will be abundantly demonstrated when the proletarian revolution has taken place. It's ridiculous calling yourself socialist. You're anarchist. Why don't you admit it? Claudia! Comrade! Oh! Oh, comrade, good to have you with us. Let me look. You know, we expected you Wednesday. That's what Zasulich said. <sighs> she told me I'd find you here. Yes, well, well you know me. I, I need an argument. I, I, I need dialectic. Today is Wednesday, do it. No, I think you're right, comrade. <laughs> Shall we drink that? Your, your arrival has forced me to defer my destruction of the anarchist position. It's a great place for anarchists is London, I love you. Let's talk, eh? Yes, of course. <laughs> A 
year, not less. Can you do it in a year? Yes, with work. What does Pekanov think? Hmm. Does it matter? Pekanov couldn't organize a trip to the theater, and God knows he's had enough practice. In any case, he's a theoretician. Organization isn't abstract enough for Georges. But has he approved the broad strategy? Pekanov and Axelrod have agreed to leave it to my judgment. That is to say, they support my view that we should not undertake a full party congress until our tendency has been strengthened at the expense of all other tendencies. When the Iskra men have a strong position within the party on the ground, then we can convene a congress which will recognize us as the leading element. And that won't happen until Iskra has won the minds of the party workers. Oh, how we have missed you, comrade. Face it. What we have now is a fragile chain of agents and contacts spread thin across Europe and Russia. It's we who are weak. We're emigres, dilettante, intellectual, unreliable. We must change that. And we must begin with ourselves if we are to create an organization of professional revolutionaries whose duty is to devote not only their free evenings, but their whole life to working for the revolution. In a year, we must have built the embryo of a party, each cell working implicitly from the nucleus, the center, the source of power. What does Georges say? Plakarov agrees. Ilyich is right. We have to establish an entirely new relationship between center and periphery. Now, I think I'd probably want a wider membership than he appears to envisage. And I'd want more power in the hands of local committees. But on the whole, I agree with your perspective. I still think it's a pity about the peasants. What is? They have revolutionary potential too. They need organizing too. They won't make the revolution. The problem of the peasant arises after the revolution when they are forced to bow to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Then we'll see how revolutionary they are. It seems a bit late leaving it till then, comrade. What do you propose to do about it then, may I ask? Shoot them all? There are millions of them. I've discussed that at length with you some other time, Comrade Zasulich. At the moment, I prefer if we stayed with the agenda. That becomes policy, then. Look, comrades, we have a newspaper, we have an organization. Now we must find the will then we will be fit to lead. Until tomorrow. Goodbye, comrades. <clears throat> Good night. Comrade Robespierre. You're too soft with him, Julius. Do you want me? No. Do you want to talk? Perhaps with the wrong people. No. They're turning into fossils, Nadia. Emmy Grays. Yes. Mrs. Richter. Who wants to know? Trotsky. Bronstein. The pen. Welcome, comrade. I'm M. Never forget the forms. We heard you were on your way, but I can't pretend we were expecting you exactly. Comrade, would you be so good as to pay the cabby for me? Seems to be having difficulty making himself understood. On the next floor, the first door on the right. Comrade Lenin. Trotsky, the pen. Trotsky, I thought you were Bronstein. Bronstein, I got tired of. Trotsky, I borrowed from a jailer just before I escaped. You think it suits? You have a letter, something. Go. 
todos. Welcome to London, comrade. It's an honor to be here, comrade Lenin. I'm entirely in your hands. Tell me what I can do. You tired? No. Why do you ask? Doesn't matter. Come. First, you must tell me what you know. People, trends, organization. A center cannot hold without intelligence. Coffee? Tea. You've uh, met our new comrade. The young eagle, wasn't it? Saporozhets called him. Something to do with the way I hold my nose, I think. <laughs> we need all the eagles we can get. Tell me. Do you mind if I remove my shoes? Not at all, please. These belong to Trotsky, too. I think the least they could do is provide warders with sensible feet. <laughs> <laughs> if I were one of the celestial bodies, I would look with complete detachment upon this miserable ball of dirt and dust. I would shine upon the good and the evil alike. But I am a man. World history, which to you, dispassionate gobbler of science, to you, bookkeeper of eternity, seems only a negligible moment in the balance of time, is to me everything. As long as I breathe, I shall fight for the future. That radiant future in which man, strong and beautiful, will become the master of the drifting stream of his history and direct it towards the boundless horizon of beauty, joy and happiness. It seems as if the new century, this gigantic newcomer, were bent at the very moment of its appearance on driving the optimist into total pessimism and civil nirvana. Surrender, you pathetic dreamer. Here I am, your long-awaited 20th century, your future. No, replies the unbowed optimist. You are only the present. Have you shown it to Plekhanov? No. He's seen other things of mine. And? He thinks my style is florid and rhetorical. What do you think? He's right. But Georges always puts style first. He's a great European. He once said, not long ago, that I had no style at all. In the French sense, of course. No, it's not the style which bothers me. I think it's too soft. I don't understand. All right. How do we achieve this future that you talk of? By struggle. How else? But against whom? The state and the classes whose interest it protects. The duty of the revolutionary is to fight those forces and personalities which impede or obstruct the socialist revolution. That's what I said. No, it isn't what you said, and you must see the difference. The future is less than six months away. We make the future with every new theory we evolve, every organizational change we set in progress. There will be no revolution. Millions will not be mobilized against the Tsarist state unless we make it possible. We are Marxists. We understand, as the anarchists and liberals cannot, the nature of power of the state and so on, but it is not enough to know the world. We must learn how to change it. And in order to do that, we must first and foremost build an organization, a party, to develop the theory and lead the revolutionary struggle. Do you see what I mean? Objectively, the enemy can be your best friend, your lover, your party colleague, the chairman of your local branch, the editor of your party journal. The enemy is he who impedes the course of the revolution. Ah, oh, the battle for now, Comrade Trotsky, is not with the Tsar with ourselves. Comrade Trotsky doesn't leave soon. He'll miss Vera Ivanovna's mutton stew. All right. Think about it. I want you to stay for a while. Work with Iskra. Find yourself. Oh, and a word of advice. Don't become an emigre. These capital cities 
fat bourgeois. They suck you in if you let them. Live only for the revolution in Russia. Do you understand? Yes. I saw a fair bit of it in Paris on my way here. Uh, you see it here, too. Tell me about Paris. Paris is like Odessa. Only Odessa is better. <laughs> I'm sorry, comrade. I mustn't miss my mutton stew. Oh, Let's no, keep no, calm. No, Wait, comrades, comrades. Comrade. So these are honest differences, and it's right we should talk them out. I see no need for personalities and name calling. Surely we're beyond that sort of thing. I beg you, comrades. Do you have further criticisms of my program, Vera Ivanovna? I simply say that as a program for the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Party, I the think draft... Vera Ivanovna has made her point, Ilyich. It's quite simple. She prefers Plakhanov's draft to yours. As to Axelrod and George himself, you, Potresov, and I prefer yours. Now, if you press for a vote, you give Comrade Plakhanov the opportunity, as chairman of the Iskra board, to cast the deciding vote in his own favour. May I make a suggestion? Please do. Give me the two drafts. Let me see if I can't find something in them to please everybody. What do you think, Comrade Trotsky? As a comrade, I mean. I think it's probably possible to safeguard your salient points within Plakhanov's text. Personally, I think Plakhanov's draft better suited to a textbook of economics than a party program. Oh, look, young man, George Plakhanov was running a revolutionary movement when your father and mother were still holding hands in the front parlour. Yes, I know. He told me. All right. I accept what you say, Julius. But I think it's important to preserve the notion of an all-out attack on czarist absolutism as well as capitalism. And it must be clearly understood through the program we eventually agree that the dictatorship of the proletariat means just that. It does not mean the dictatorship of the proletariat in conjunction with the peasants. With those two conditions, I concede the need to prepare a new Congress program based on both drafts. Now, it looks like July. Comrades, in Brussels. Questions? Good. <coughs> Would you mind waiting a little longer, Ilyich? A uh, comrade has asked if he might <coughs> address the meeting. He's upstairs now. Upstairs? Why was this not on the agenda? Uh, comrade Milutin arrived only this afternoon from Orlov. I bring the matter up only now because I didn't want the main body of the meeting to be disrupted. I see. What does comrade Milutin want? I think he should be allowed to tell us that himself. Mm. Nevertheless. Comrade Milutin has laid grave charges against one of our own agents. Who? N. E. Bauman. What charges? Bauman got Milutin's wife with child during his exile in Orlov. After his escape, he began to slander her, labelled her the whore of Orlov, and even used our own underground networks to revile her. It wasn't long, naturally, before party workers in Orlov picked up the stories. To defend her honor, as she put it, she hanged herself. This is her suicide note. It's addressed to the party. Vera Ivanovna has already seen it. So? Will you see him? No. Christ, you will, though! You what? You won't see a comrade who has travelled 4,000 miles to ask for justice from the party of... What did it say? The party of the struggle for the freedom, the dignity and the happiness of man. I'll fetch him in myself. You're a disgrace to the party. You're a steer to the monster. Vera Ivanovna. Vera Ivanovna! I'm sorry, I will not give that man. I'm going to fetch Milutin down and he shall see you. Come with you. Come with you. Come with you. I'm sorry. Come with you. I'm sorry. Come with you. Come with you. Come with you. I've written to Pekarnov, urging that you be co-opted onto the board. 
That is, if you still want it. More than ever. She won't come back. But she won't bring in Milutin unless we send for him. Anything else? Yes. I haven't finished. I want to know what you intend doing about Bauman. Nothing. I think there should be an inquiry. Nadia, tell Comrade Mart of Comrade Bauman's role in the Iskra network. I know his role, Comrade. Don't play the grandfather with me. It doesn't work. Then don't be so childish. Bowman is an outstanding agent. Not average, not good. Outstanding. In party matters, I would trust him above anyone else I know. Now, you're asking that he be disciplined? How? Expelled? Yes. Yes. Certainly, if it's true. For personal misdemeanors. Let me tell you, comrade, I rule an inquiry as being out of order, as outside the competence of Iskra and detrimental to the interests of the party. Now, if you want my private views on the matter, you can have them, privately. You can't, you can't separate private from public like that. Can't you see that, man? We are what we do, you, me, Bauman, all of us. Party morality isn't simply loyalty to the party. It's, it's the highest level of ethical consciousness yet afforded the human species. <laughs> Metaphysics, Julius! Another time, perhaps, we may speculate. Right now, we are trying to make the revolution possible. So, you'll do nothing. I will do my duty. That is to say, I will protect Comrade Bauman from any move on your or anybody else's part to expel or discipline him. Now, be warned. I think we should go. You go. I want to speak with Vera Ivanovna. I'll follow. It's simple, see? I'm the party, right? Party organ. Hmm? Hmm? Central committee. Right? Central organ, central committee. See? I'm the party. Hmm? I'm the party. No, I'm... Mm. Mm. Julius, you're not listening. March off! I can't go on like this, Volodya. Let me get a doctor. I want you to pack the trunks and prepare to leave. We can't leave. You're ill, man. Do it! Oh, do it. Try <gasps> to take a little bread and milk. Listen. Tell Julius I want to see him. Julius is in Paris, en route for Geneva. There's a meeting of the organizing committee. Did he call? It blew up very suddenly. He left as soon as he heard of the meeting. He's still hurt and bitter. Did he say who 
called a meeting of the organizing committee. No, he didn't. Try to rest, love. Rest? I'll rest when they rest. I must go to Geneva to see Plakhanov. It looks as if Julius is making his bid for power. No. No. I say the party must be built like a fist. Like a brain bored. He wants a party like a saucer full of calves, hearts put down for the cat. I must show him he's wrong. Thank you, comrade. Elish, we meet again. How are you? We've been worried about you. Oh, recovered, thank you. Sit down, sit down. Well, we're almost there. You've worked hard. The operative word is almost, George. Hmm. I've dreamed of this Congress for over a quarter of a century. You know that? The Congress that will unify the party. With Iskra as its theoretical and organizational center. Exactly, comrade. But will it? How do you mean? We of Iskra have 41 votes out of a total of 51. Our principal opposition being the Jewish Bund with five votes and the Workers' Cause and the Southern Workers' Faction with two votes each. Theoretically. We of the Iskra group cannot fail to dominate the Congress, push through our own resolutions, elect our own people to the Central Committee. The question remaining is, who will control Iskra? Doesn't Iskra speak with one voice? What do you think? You surprise me. Why, go, of course, there have been personal frictions, the Bauman affair, for example. But surely there's no evidence of ideological division, is there? George. Martov has tabled his own draft rules for yes, party membership. I've seen the agenda. I must say I've read them side by side, yours and his. And I'm damned if I can see much to choose between them. Part, of course, from a certain stylistic difference. I'll tell you the difference in a sentence, George. His rules allow anyone, any opportunist, any windbag, any professor, any high school student to proclaim himself a member of the party. Whereas my rules, our rules, George, Confine membership to a narrow vanguard of professional revolutionaries owing strict allegiance to the party centre. That's the difference. I'm not sure that I accept the definition of Martov's formulation that you offer, Elish. Well, I think you should, George. Because Comrade Martov certainly does. Are you sure? Perfectly. Then I'd better speak to him. Uh, I think that might make matters worse. I think we should simply see to it that his rules are defeated. How? Oh. Canvas. Argue. Persuade. Make sure of our votes. Secure them. Keep them hard if they look like softening. I think we are the right people to lead the Revolutionary Party, Comrade Plekhanov. Theory and organization drawn together. Like that. What do you think? Let us build the party, comrade. I've always been fascinated by your hardness. It's always seemed to me so unrelative. I was a gentle enough child. One thing I must insist on. 
There should be no place for the man Trotsky on the new editorial board. He's too young and he's too arrogant. All right. I withdraw my suggestion. Is it still London if the police stop us in Brussels? Mm, that's right. Well, I don't anticipate any trouble. Autonomy among individual groups cannot be tolerated. The party must be supreme. So let me get this straight, comrade. If the Jewish Bund refuses to surrender to party control over its own organization, this Congress is prepared to expel us from the party. Yes, how is many that times the meaning? Do I have to tell you? Yes. Then I demand that this Procedures Committee rule that the resolution be deferred. The there must be a commission. Then. You know what our collective view on the board is, part We are now the Procedures Ooh. Committee of the Second is Congress no of the Justice Six delegates have just been arrested in the hotels. The Belgian police are on Comrades, way. comrades, six delegates have been arrested in their hotels. I'm informed that the Belgian police are on their way here to break up this meeting now. Comrades, the contingency plan is now operative. Congress will reconvene in London in four days' time. Go now. Go now. Take care of Krupskaya. Ah, comrade, how fortunate. We'll travel together. I'm sorry I couldn't get Bakarov to co-opt you on the board. There was nothing I could do. No. Nothing, comrade? No, of course. Well, you coming with me? No. I shall make my own way. Avoid personalities, comrade. They could prove your downfall. overboard a section of those who, even if they cannot be admitted to an organization, are nevertheless party members. <laughs> we are a party of a class, comrades. We must take care that we do not leave outside the party ranks those people who consciously, though perhaps not very actively, associate themselves with our party. Indeed, the more widespread the title party member, the better. Comrade Malcolm is right. <laughs> For me, a conspiratorial organization only has meaning when it is enveloped by a broad social democratic working class party. You're confusing a party with a movement, comrade. They're not the same thing. No, comrade. It is you who are confused. You confuse the party with a bunch of professional thugs who will do your argument, comrades. Reserve your abuse for the enemy. I look forward to the day, comrade. When every striker, every demonstrator against the Tsar and his regime accounts for his actions by stating, I am a member of the Social Democratic Party of Russia. If you support that hope, you will support this motion. Comrade Lenin. Thank you, Comrade Chairman. Comrades, you've heard the arguments, Martovs and mine. What we're arguing about is both an image and a reality. If you support my motion, you vote for coherence, organization, discipline. Above all, for power at the center. You will say, in effect, that it is important to distinguish between those who belong to the party and those who associate themselves with it. You will make the necessary distinction between an entire class shaped by capitalism and its vanguard, the party. The title party member is a fiction if it cannot be made to correspond to the facts Capitalism is bound to weigh down wide sections of the working class with oppression, disunity, stultification. Social democracy seeks to lift the worker out of his present level of consciousness to a genuinely revolutionary one. But if we fail to recognize the distinction, there is no way we can achieve that end. Vote for Martov's proposal and you create a tea party. <laughs> Not a party of revolutionaries ready to lead a class into battle. Those in favor of Comrade Lenin's proposals on party membership? Twenty-three. Those in favor of Comrade Martov's proposals? Twenty-eight. Comrade Martov's proposals are carried. <laughs> Good fun. 
Oh, yes. There's nothing funnier than watching a man commit political suicide. You think so? Today, you have entered into an opportunist alliance with the center and right-wing elements. You've surrendered your political credibility. I doubt it. In any case, you left me little option in the matter. You forced me to beat you. You've won a battle, comrade. The war has only just begun. Full focus meeting tonight to discuss our list for Central Committee and Party Council. 7.30 sharp. Questions? No. Good. Barman, when does the Commission on the Bund propose reporting back? The next week sometime, according to Tuparici. I want the vote and the report first thing tomorrow. You see Tuparici, I'll see Pekanov. Do it now. Comrade Shotman. Let me in. Comrade Tuparici Shanovsky. Comrade Liangnik. Comrade Noskov. That concludes the list for the Central Committees. Now, I don't have to remind you that the voting will be solid. We have outlived the wavering days. The Bund. I've seen Bekanov. The Bund problem will be taken first thing tomorrow. To Parigi, is your commission ready to report? It will be by now. Good. No problem? No problem. Good. Right, that's all. Now, let Comrade Markov in when the other comrades have left, will you? Do you want me? What is happening, Volodya? I don't know what you mean. I was in caucus. You had me locked out! Why? Because you no longer belong to the caucus. Why? Because my motion won the majority in Congress. No! Because your majority was based on an openly opportunist alliance with the swamp. With those elements, we as a tendency have been fighting for the last year. There was no alliance. I haven't spoken with the Bund since Brussels. Believe it! Volodya. Comrade. There are no fundamental differences between us. The can't we simply sit down and talk it out. We share the same vision, comrade. We spent the night talking, the night before Siberia. Don't you remember? On and on, building the vision. Tell me what I must do. I can't do that. You must find that for yourself. The choices are clear. If you are not to be tainted with the Bund for the rest of your days, you must make it clear tomorrow that your position is as it always was. That total authority over activities of members shall be exercised by the party centre. Tomorrow? And the Procedures Committee have decided to tackle the question of the Bund at once. But the Bund Commission hasn't reported yet. Now that's been taken care of. If, on the other hand, you decide that you need the votes of the Bund and other centre elements to gain control of the party, you will be exposed as an opportunist and a counterfeit revolutionary. The choice is yours. There can be no question of my cynically changing my position over national autonomy within the party. My position is identical with yours, as you very well know, comrade. The point is not that I know it. The point is that the whole party, including the Bund, knows it. I wanted to talk to you about the composition of the new central committees. There is good argument for building on the existing organizing committee. Um, there's nothing to talk about. We've decided our list. See. I see. Have you also made recommendations as to who should be elected dictator of the party? Hmm? Or will you be able to manage without that? I ask you a question, comrade! Yeros Asulich was right! Axelrod was right! Potresov was right! You think you're rogues, Pierre! That's 
write what they think. By God, they're right. Now the vote itself. Those against the Jewish Bund being allowed to remain in the party. Forty-one. Yeah. Overwhelming majority in favour of expulsion. Withdraw. You should withdraw. There is no question of staying, comrades. The insult and humiliation you have dealt us will live with us many a day. Like you, we dream of and work for the socialist revolution. All we ask is that we be allowed to do it in our own language with our own people. You deny us this basic right because of some. Napoleon, who craves oh, money. Oh, 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 well, we will continue to work for the revolution. With or without the aid of the party we helped to form. The workers' cause group wish to demonstrate their solidarity with the Bund against the dictatorial tendencies that are emerging within the party apparatus. We hereby withdraw from the Congress. An opportunist, it will not be in my direction that it looks. If it does not label you an opportunist, it may well conclude you're a fool. I believe it may very well call you both. Now, nominations for the new editorial board of Iskra. Comrade Lenin. We have already, in an earlier vote, affirmed the role of Iskra as the ideological center of our party. It is now our duty to elect its editorial board, whose role it will be to lay down party guidelines for political action in the struggle against the Russian state. I have, as you know, been associated with Iskra since its foundation three years ago. And I think I can say, in all modesty, that the work we have done on the Iskra front has been of decisive influence in the shaping and development of our party. But it is the future, not the past which calls us on. Times change, capacities change, objective circumstances change. What our party journal requires now is a small nucleus of trained ideologues and organizers capable of spreading the work far and wide across the Russian Empire. It is for that reason that I propose to decrease the number of seats from six to three. And furthermore, I nominate Iskra editors, myself, Comrade Plekhanov, and Comrade Martov. This is not possible, Comrade Chairman. Haven't we already voted for the continuance of the Iskra board? You bastard! You dirty, stinking, dictatorial bastard! Jesus God, if I had a pistol, I'd blow your rotten brains out! You're not a comrade, you're a dictator, you're a bloody czar! I see your game, Lenin. Hook or by crook, isn't it any way so long as it's your way? You with all your hard men all around you! And what do you care about loyalty and service and dedication? I spent a lifetime, and so has Axelrod and Petresov, of devotion to this party. And now what do you do? You cut it off just like that, to fall into the swamp. You're no man to lead this great movement. And you, you whom I've worshipped as a great mind and comrade, one of these days, this man will eat you for breakfast. You're too old, sir. So Beauty comes. Only the revolution remains forever, young man. Come on, 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 I will not accept nomination under these arrangements. Your 
are not able to refuse, comrade. Under the laws you yourself voted in only days ago. I will not serve with that man. That man is not a good man. If this is Comrade Lenin's image of the party, I want no part of it. What he has done today shames and degrades all of us. Sazulich and Axelrod in particular have fought all their lives to build the party. And now here on the brink of success, they are ruthlessly cut off, sent out into the wilderness to satisfy the insatiable lust for power of one individual. Comrades, we are privileged to be listening to the sound of party debate, new style. I so move, Comrade Chairman. We dedicate this great unifying Congress to the memory of the man who lies herein. Well, goodbye, comrades. Good luck, wherever your work may take you. I must speak with Vera Ivanovna. I must. I did what I had to do. But what you had to do was not what had to be done. At least I didn't destroy the party. Yesterday the party was made, not destroyed. And what is more, history will prove it to be the only party, the only sort of party capable of capturing state power. You seem to think a party is an organization for the deliberation of complex moral choices, a sort of political sewing circle. Well, you will not find the Tsar and von Plever and Trepov and Witter and the state apparatus sitting around deliberating moral choices. They are organizing their defenses. And there is only one slogan that will defeat them, Salus Populi Lex Suprema Est. In revolutionary language, the success of the revolution is the supreme law. Now, until you can say that, comrade, and mean it, history will have no use for you. I suppose that will depend on who writes the history. Sulich wept. She cannot understand why you have done what you have done. Remember Minosinsk? Remember the peasant crouched over in the field, jerking his arms about inexplicably? We thought he was mad. But when we had walked across the field and reached him, we saw at once that he was sharpening his scythe on a stone. From the path, it was impossible to say. She has nothing left, she said. There is nothing to be done about that. 